Hi, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming out today. I know this has been a long day for everyone. You've got a lot of good information, so I'm going to do my best to keep this to about 35 minutes so we have 10 minutes for questions, and then after that, you guys will be able to go get food, drinks, unwind a bit. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is deploying machine learning in Domo. So I'm going to use three separate use cases that we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about three different methods that you can use to use machine learning within Domo. And then I'm also going to talk about three separate examples to illustrate each of those. And so as we go through, I'm going to talk and I'm going to start by discussing a little bit about who I am and what we do. So um, just to let everyone know, so I'm Jonathan Prantner. I'm the Chief Analytics Officer at RxA. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about what RxA is very briefly, dis under explain the partnership that we have with Domo, why that's a valuable thing for us, and why we decided to do that. Then we're going to go through our three cases. In the first case, we're going to explain how we can use SQL to start to put some of the basics of machine learning into analysis that we do. And with that, we're going to use an example where we're going to talk about interest rates and applications. Second case we're going to look at is understanding what customers are saying about our brand and different ways that we can use natural language processing. And we're going to focus in a bit on sentiment to use an analysis around that and see how you can use the magic ETL and the different scripting tiles that are available to start to understand what consumers are saying, make that actionable, and put it in the hands of your decision makers. Final piece we're going to look at is when we want to do a little bit more advanced modeling, where we're going to take some of the data, move it out of Domo, and in this case, we're going to look at moving it to R, train some models there, and then move the information back into Domo and how we can make that a seamless process. And the example that we're going to talk about at that point, we're going to look a little bit around media mix modeling and really determining what the optimal level of media spend is. As we go through this, there are going to be three key takeaways that we're going to discuss and that I really want to emphasize. The first is that machine learning can help answer concrete business questions. So everyone's here because you know, one of the hottest things to talk about is AI and machine learning. Everybody knows it's something that they want to do. But a lot of times, it seems like it's a huge mountain to climb. And that in order to get any actual insights out of it, you have to build an essentially like a Skynet system that's going to run your entire business in an automated process. That is not what we're talking about here today. What we're going to talk about is finding specific business cases, selecting the best possible machine learning solution to solve those, and then taking that information, putting it in the hands of the users. Second key point that we're going to emphasize is how Domo helps you to enable these processes to do it through different levels of skill, different levels of complexity, so you can get the answers that you want and the things that you need. And finally, we're going to, as we go through this, showcase how Domo is able to take these machine learning solutions out of the hands of the data science team and bring them to the tactical decision makers. Because one thing that we've seen over the years, and because I've worked in uh, this space for quite a while, is that quite often you have a data science team. And it's a small team that's usually part of maybe a larger analytics team. And then that analytics team may be part of, say, a larger marketing team. And so you can have your data scientists that spend months and months getting models that may end up giving you one number. It's a key number that you want to have. But then the issue is, once you have that, to kind of break down that silo so that, OK, the rest of the analytics team sees it, they appreciate it. It's the type of thing they like to talk about, but how often does it get used? And if you can't get it into the hands of the people outside the analytics team that are making those decisions, then the whole process is really pointless. So RxA and Domo. So RxA is a um, premier partner of Domo. We're actually the um, 2019 um, innovative partner. And we are um, an agency that essentially does a few different things. So we do custom Domo implementations. We do custom apps. But when people ask me what I do, I say, well, we are an applied artificial intelligence agency. And that's great. Usually, you know, the Lyft driver then kind of looks at you and says, oh, OK. But what that means to me is that we're out there and we're not researchers. We're not academics that are trying to come up with the next thing that's going to replace neural networks. 
we are out there and we are looking across the entire space. We're seeing what's been created, the best ways to do that. We're tweaking it in specific ways, and then we're bringing it into organizations to put it in the hands of people so that they can make decisions. And we do this across a number of different clients and across a number of different use cases. So for some clients we work and we do things like staffing optimization where we go out and we tell them in their stores we can predict how much traffic you're going to have, how you know, many, be it repair orders, be it um, sales that you're gonna have. And from that on a 30 minute increment throughout the week we can tell them how many people they're gonna need in order to staff that. For other clients it may be focused on things like social media to understand what's going on, to take that information and use it to monitor how their brand's performing. If they have issues around quality, they wanna pick up on that, see what people are talking about before it becomes an issue that may lead to something like a recall. And so the great thing about working with Domo and the reason that at RxA we've decided to partner with them is because it really enables you to once again break down those barriers, to take the data that you have, put it in the hands of the right people. And so the um, first thing we're gonna talk about is an example where we're gonna use some of the basics of machine learning and use this simply through SQL. And so when we talk about machine learning, there's a lot of different definitions out there. Now I've been working in the data science space for over 20 years now, so I've seen kind of the evolution. We started and everything was very much traditional statistics. Everything was based on probabilities. We'd run logistic regressions. We'd run um, mixed models with random effects. But all of those were making a lot of assumptions where as we go through, we assume that the data had normal distributions or that things weren't correlated with one another. As time went on and as computing power increased, we were able to start to do things like Bayesian analysis. Now when we look at Bayes compared to traditional statistics, it really gives a better representation because just thinking of something simple like a confidence interval. If you all remember your first stats classes, it was the hardest concept to really drill in because I have a 95% confidence interval. Doesn't mean I have 95% confidence that this is the right number. It just means if I repeat this 100 times, 95 times it's gonna fall in there. Once we went to Bayes, then you started to interpret those confidence intervals, they actually mean it what they sounded like. But the issue there was you're still doing a lot of, um, it requires a lot of computing power. It would go through, and Bayes was something which I would say 10, 15 years ago, everyone wanted to do, but it never really caught on because it didn't really give you a different answer than what you were getting from the traditional models. That's where once kind of the computing power of the cloud took off, and you can now in 10 minutes stand up um, 96 virtual VCUs with tons of RAM, that's where machine learning came in. And what I think of as machine learning is, it's a series of algorithms that repeat over time. And that's the big thing, is going through, cycling through it over and over again to get something which is the most robust answer that you can have. And so we're gonna take a very simple example and see how you can use machine learning to do that through SQL and Domo. And so let's imagine for a minute that you're a retailer. And as a retailer, you have your own credit card. So there's someone somewhere in your organization whose job it is to determine how much profit you're getting from that. And so when we think of profit, there's probably a couple of different things. There's you know, how much we're getting from interest per individual and how many individuals. So somewhere along the line, someone is gonna make that decision that says, okay, if I'm gonna raise my interest rates, I'm going to get you know, more profit for my interest. But what is that going to do in terms of the number of applications that I have? And so that's what we want to look at. And the way we're going to do this is basically the simplest way, which is looking at the elasticity. And so elasticity looks at two variables, and it says, as I change one variable, what impact does that have on my other variable? So as I'm going to increase those interest rates, what's that going to do to my number of applications? And so this is a very straightforward equation where we're just going to look at applications on one side, we're going to look at the interest rate on the other. And we're taking the natural log of both sides because that takes it from raw numbers where we're saying, okay, if I have this interest rate, I expect this number of applications. Now, just by taking that natural log, we're going to see as this changes by X percent, then we expect this to change by Y percent. So it's a very straightforward equation that we have here where essentially our coefficient gives us our elasticity. 
So this is great, right? It gives us our answer, no machine learning needed. How does this relate to deploying machine learning? The thing is, there are a couple of cases where the data that we have is either too big or too small to give us the answer that we need. And so in cases where it's too big, you may have data and there may be some cases where you know, rates went really high or rates went really low for a while, but it wasn't enough. There wasn't enough there compared to the rest of the data. So overall, the rest of the data is really going to kind of decrease that effect. I think of it as kind of like smushing it down. So in that case, you may want to look at smaller samples of data. The other case is, let's say, you know, we have our interest rates, we have our number of applications, but we only change our rates by month. So then there's not a lot of data that we have there. So when there's not a lot of data, then if we have some outliers, that's really going to influence things one way or another. So a concept that you use in machine learning that we can then bring in is bootstrapping. And what bootstrapping is, is you have a large data set or a small data set, but you have all of your data. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to grab a subset of it. So let's say I'm going to grab, if it's a large data set, I might grab 20% of my data. I'll run a model on that, put it back, mix it all up, grab another random 20%. If it's a small data set, I might do the same thing, but I'm going to grab 80% out. Because that way, I'm going to grab 80%. It's going to get most of the data. If I have some outliers, you know, just it's going to be there most of the time, but sometime it's not. So it's going to give me a little bit more of that variability. And so the way that we can do this then, going back to our example of um, the elasticity, is now we take our original data set, we pull out a number of different random samples. And then from those random samples, we're going to compute that same simple equation each time. And for each of these now, we're going to get a separate coefficient. And so with those coefficients then, we're just going to use some kind of uh, technique, averaging, something like that, to get our overall elasticity. And what this does then is it gives us a more robust answer. And this is kind of, in my mind, the simplest way to think of what machine learning is doing. Because we're looking at the data, we're sampling it, we're running some sort of model on it, be it a simple regression equation like this, be it um, a regression tree, which as we do over and over time becomes a random forest in machine learning. So doing this over and over allows us to get something which is more robust. So that's great, but we want to know how we can do this in Domo. And so what we set up is we set up a process for this where essentially we had a data set that was coming in every 15 minutes. And every time that data set came in, it would kick off a process that would grab a random sample of data, and then it would compute the elasticity. And so this here is the equation for the elasticity. And so if any of you are interested in this, you can just go to rxa.io slash domo. You can download this code. Um, we have the SQL code for this as well as some things that we're going to be looking at a little bit later on. And um, for this, I have to thank my first statistics professor, Professor Gillespie, because he made us go through once and compute a regression model by hand. He said, you're never going to do this again in your life, but once you do this, you will always understand it. So that's a very simple equation here. We're looking at the sums of square of x, sums of square of y, and we're looking at the combination of the two. And from that, we're getting our elasticity. And so this is something that we're able to accomplish in Domo by using kind of a recursive data flow where each time this runs, every 15 minutes, it's extracting that elasticity. It's putting that into a new table. So then we have a table where that charts over and over time. And so how this looks in Domo then is we can see here, if we look all the way to the left, this is just um, charting it over time. We can see kind of this inverse relationship that we have between the two of these. So we can see our rates going up. We can see as they go up, then our applications go down and vice versa. If we move one over to the right, now we're looking just from 2010 on. So this is kind of essentially post-financial crisis because a lot of times what we see is anything that we did before that doesn't hold up quite as well. So sometimes we look just at that later point in time. And if we look all the way to the right here, we can see that we have, you know, from the bootstrap details, we have all of these different elasticities. And in this case, they're extremely consistent. You can see, you know, 41's down the line, but then the occasional 39, 42, 40. And then in the middle, what that gives us is that gives us a 41%. So from the data science side, this is what we want. This is the number that we have. 
And so what that tells us then is if we raise our interest rates by 20%, we're going to expect a 7% drop in applications. And uh, just to run through the math on that very quickly, the equation is just, once again, you have one plus your rate of your increase raised to the elasticity minus one. So we have one plus our 20% raised to our negative 0.41 minus one, which gives us our 7% drop. And the key to this is once we have that, you can then use that to enable the team to create a custom app, for instance, which would have a little slider. So someone who wants to go in there and they say, okay, we're thinking about changing our rates by half a basis point, or we're going to change things you know, by two basis points, they can see what that immediate impact is so they can understand and start to build out that use case. Now we're gonna get into our second case. And so here we're gonna talk a little bit about how we can deploy natural language processing through that magic ETL in Domo to solve a specific use case. And in this case, what we wanna look at is we wanna understand what issues our customers have with our stores today. So we know that we get tons of data back from customers, be it public where they're talking to one another on the internet, be it something that you're getting back feedback from reviews, be it phone calls that you're getting from your complaint center that you take the voice and then you have a voice to text translation that you can do. There's a lot of data that you have around what people are talking about, but what you have to do is really make that actionable. And so the process of making that actionable all falls under the heading of natural language processing. And there's a lot of definitions of natural language processing, and you can talk about, you know, tokenizing terms, you can talk about looking at the vectorization of things, but I think of it quite simply as you have words, you have sentences, and then you wanna translate them into numbers so that from those numbers you can see how closely related things are, how things trend in time, how they relate to other metrics, and then you turn that back into words so that you have something that's useful for the human brain to understand. And so there's a lot of different parts of sentiment analysis and the, or I'm sorry, of natural language processing. And the one that we're gonna focus in on right now is sentiment analysis. And so, as uh, some of you are probably familiar with, sentiment is looking at the tonality of what you're saying. So when we're looking at customer comments, we wanna know, are they talking about us in a positive light? Are they talking about us in a negative light? You can go steps further to understand kind of what emotions they're expressing at different times. And so if we look here, you know, this is a chart of sentiment and this is focused in on some automotive data. So we look at kind of different themes. And so when we're detecting themes, what we wanna do is kind of take the paragraphs or sentences that we have from customers and we're gonna break those into, you know, two word, three word, four word phrases. And then we see how often they occur, we see how they relate to one another. So this chord chart that we have here, we can look at issues and say, okay, if customers are talking about the quality of our vehicle, and they're talking about that in a positive light, how does that relate to how they're talking about the styling of our vehicle? To start to understand those relationships back and forth. And so from here, we wanna understand how we can do this in Domo. And so from that, we're able to um, use something which is known as Vader. And so Vader is a library which is available in Python, and so it's something that can be imported, and Vader is the Valiance Aware Dictionary and Sentiment Resonator. And what it is, is the lexicon and rule-based sentiment analysis tool. And in general, those can get you kind of the first step to where you're going, because anything that's lexicon-based is a little tricky. Because if we think back to, say, 80s or 90s slang, and someone could be like, oh, you know, I really like your coat, that's bad, right? Not a term we use anymore, but perfect example here. So classic sentiment is gonna say, okay, we're looking at this lexicon based, bad is negative. Well, Vader is something which is especially termed and um, kind of keyed to social media. So it's meant to pick up on some of those things. So for instance, if someone were to say, I only had to wait for 45 minutes, that's gonna come through classic sentiment tools as fairly neutral because there's like only, which is maybe a good term, and wait, which is maybe a negative term, but there's not much there. So one of the nice things about Vader is that it can pick up on the uh, modicons afterwards. So if someone said, oh, I only had to wait 45 minutes, smiley face, it suddenly knows that that's positive. 
if the same thing, I only have to wait 45 minutes, frowny face, then it's picking up that, that means sarcasm there, and so it's going to be a bit negative. Also one of the nice things is actually with that, if they say, I only in caps had to wait 45 minutes, frowny face, then it actually increases the negativity on that. And so we're going to look at a specific example around this. And what we focused in on is AutoZone. AutoZone's a client that um, we know fairly well, and so we looked at a bit of their data. And we used our RxA voice of customer um, data connector to go out and grab the data for this. And with this, what we focused in on is looking at places where customers are having conversations about the brand. So we tend to shy away from things like Facebook and Twitter because those tend to be um, much more reactionary. They don't have in-depth conversations. So we really focused in on review sites, blogs, and Reddit to understand what was going on. And so you can see here, you get the data, you pull it all in, we have it. First thing you do is you throw up a word cloud, right? First thing we see is check engine light is in huge lights. This is not going to bring any insight to the brand because they know this, but for those of you that aren't that familiar with AutoZone, one of the things that they're known for is if that check engine light ever comes on in your car, you can take it into AutoZone, they'll hook it up, they'll tell you what that code means for free. And as someone who had a problem a number of years ago with the check engine light recurrently coming on, that's actually a very useful thing because it gives you a jumping off point. So this is something that, you know, for this brand, they know about, and so it's good that it pops up. But let's look at how we can then take this data that we have and use Domo to do some sentiment analysis around it through the Magic ETL. So what we have here is just a little look at the Magic ETL. So we have the data that's coming in. Uh, we're filtering it a little bit to pull out um, the time frame that we want, and then we're grouping it based on a couple of things. And you can see we're splitting it there. And the way that we have the data, we're splitting it into two things. One is on the top line that was just based at kind of the post level. And at the bottom level, that's based on the theme level. And so when we talk about themes, that's like before when we were looking at styling, quality. It's the different things that show up in the data that we're seeing that are more than just a word that actually means something. And they can be, you know, a couple words, they can be, you know, a few. And then from there we dropped in the Python scripting tile. And so with the Python scripting tile, with that, we're able to use Vader and bring that library in and then we're able to use this um, polarity indicator. So that's going to go through, and then for everything that we run through, it's going to give us that polarity score. So then we're able to take a look at each one of those comments that we're getting from customers, determine the overall polarity, and how positive or negative it is. And then from that, we're able to join it back to the post, so then we're able to understand what those posts are. And once again, if you guys are familiar with Python or have anyone in your organization that is, you can just go to rxa.io slash domo. This Python code is there. You can download it and uh, you can play around with that a little bit. So with looking at how this looks in domo, so then we create different dashboards around this so that we can show some of the different things, you know, how many comments there are, kind of what the sentiment is across the different categories, how that's changing over time. And then if we look on the left-hand side here, this is just really showcasing the sentiment that's coming out. So there's some things there where we see like great customer service, which is popping out as positive, which we would expect. And then we can also see you know, some other things that are just very clearly negative terms that are coming out. So as we looked through this, it was, you know, we wanted to go back to that original business question that we were asking which is what are my customers' concerns about my stores that I can address today? And the thing that popped up for us was gas caps. Not the first thing we expected, not the first thing AutoZone expected. But what we learned was that when a gas cap doesn't fit, it damages the brand's reputation. And the process for finding this and once again, going back to that concept of why at RxA we like working with Domo is because it puts these insights that we have, so it brings that natural language processing, puts it in the hands of the business user. So they have a dashboard that's monitoring the conversation. You can go in and look at that any time. And then with that, we set up some alerting. So whenever anything has a certain threshold of comments, so if something wasn't um, a theme that we're seeing before and now it pops up, we're going to get an alert for it. If something has a certain polarity and then that changes, so if people were talking about it positively and now it's going negative, an alert's going to trigger. 
or if there's a combination thereof, where if it's a certain level of negativity and then you get a certain number of comments, that's when that's going to pop up. And so that's how gas caps popped up. And so once that alert comes, individual user goes back to that dashboard. They are able to click in on that and then it takes them to see the actual posts. So now you can see the posts here and how we have the um, sentiment ranked for them. So we have things that are clearly positive, things that fall in the middle that are kind of positive to neutral, those that are strictly neutral, those that are um, neutral to negative, and those that are negative. And by clicking into a negative comment, they can then actually go back and it takes them to the actual board forum Reddit thread where they have that. And so in this case, we have a customer who has a Hummer and they say, hey, I have this problem, I got my gas cap and I keep getting these error codes that are popping up because it's telling me that my fuel system isn't closed. And this is something that I know because when I mentioned before that I had a vehicle, it was not a Hummer, but when I had a vehicle that kept getting those check engine lights, it was because there was an issue with my fuel tank system where it thought that there was air getting in so I kept getting those signals. That's how the customer puts this out there. Then we have Lou, who is supposedly an expert on the brand. He's out there in this forum, he talks a lot, and he says, oh, your gas cap, you're getting these codes, you bought it from AutoZone. Customer replies, yeah, how did you know I bought it from AutoZone? AutoZone's infamous for that. So taking this and going back to that original business question we're asking, what is something that's a concern of my customers in my stores today? Understanding that gas caps, something that is just a tiny part of their business, is negatively impacting their brand this much, that is something that you can set out and you can say, all right, I'm going to set three people, I'm going to give them a task force, I'm going to give them three months to solve this problem. We're either going to do new training in our stores, we're going to see how well our inventory aligns to our models, we're going to go back to our suppliers, we're going to change this. And then the other thing that we can do is we can actually go through, click through, find out who Lou is, and we can say, hey, by the way, Lou, we saw you had this post, we went, we know this is a concern now, we created a task force, we're solving this, we would either like you to be a part of it, we would like you to give us feedback, and then you can take your brand detractor and you can turn them into a brand champion for you. And this is all something that's enabled through Domo and it once again takes it out of the hands of the data scientists that created that sentiment analysis, puts it into the hand of the product manager that's looking and monitoring that sentiment. Final case we're going to talk about here is looking at um, some advanced modeling and using Domo R. And so Domo R is actually something where now we're taking the data outside of the Domo instance and we're going to bring it into our, our environment. So this is something that we use in different cases where maybe we want to, you know, train a model that's going to take a lot more time and then use that model for scoring. So a little bit earlier on I mentioned that case where we're doing the staffing optimization. So with that we brought in all the history that they had around their um, time clock data, we brought in all the history that they had around all the different orders that they've had over a number of years uh, across hundreds of locations and we brought in a lot of external data. So we brought in some weather data which was nice because since we're using Domo for this, we were able to um, use some of the connectors that they have. Then we brought in some external data that we had because for instance, if they're doing repairs outside of, you know, the store, that's going to impact the amount of traffic that they have. And, you know, as I said before, we have a lot of computing power that's available for us now. And so we stood up a huge instance to run this model. Still took three weeks. But once we had that model that was trained off that, that took three weeks to run, we can use this on an ongoing basis to score things in moments. But the example that we're going to talk about now is actually around media mix and really understanding what it means to have the amount of media that you have in the market and what the right level of spends are. So this uh, past summer we actually did a study where we worked with 300 car dealerships and we brought in all their data. So we brought in all of their historic uh, media spend data. We brought in all of their um, DMS data, which essentially for car dealerships, that's kind of essentially tracks everything they have. Every sale they've had, every repair order they had, we brought in all of that data. We brought in all of their web data 
at the individual level. So not just looking at kind of the aggregates like how many visits we had. We brought in every consumer's journey and we brought that data together to try to answer the questions. And because we went, we met with those dealers, we asked them, in terms of media, what are the things that you need to know that you don't have the information for right now? And this is the list that they gave us. And so we use Domo in this case as both our ETL layer that's bringing in the data, joining it together, doing all of the manipulation that we have, and then from there, we use Domo R to take that data, securely move it over to our, um, our servers that we had set up in a secure environment, run the analysis, bring it back to Domo for the visualization, and then we had those existing models for ongoing scoring. So we train the models, and then they're there for scoring. And so the thing that we really wanted to solve for them was to understand where they had waste and how efficient their media was. So as we look across this curve here, so this is kind of a simplified S curve, and essentially you want to be in the green area. That's the part where you're getting the most return for your dollar. You're getting positive returns and it's at its most effective rates. If you're down in the blue below, that's where you have not right yet reached a point where you're getting economies of scale. So if you think about it in terms of different media types, if you're only putting a sprinkling out there, it's not breaking through to customers, so that's not valuable. But if you're in the red area, then you're overspending. You're putting more money into this channel than you are getting back. And so you're making someone else happy. That could be your ad providers, that could be, um, quite often we see this in search, but you're giving money away to someone else. And what we found through the study was that half of dealers were in that area. And that's not saying that over the entire period of the study we found that you know, a dealer would end up there once because obviously everyone is going to overspend at one time. On a monthly basis, in at least one channel, half of the dealers were overspending. But as we look along this, you know, we see along our horizontal axis the different amounts of spend that we have. And we see along our vertical axis, you know, our sales gross profit. There's one problem though. In car dealerships, you don't have online transactions. There's no e-commerce that takes place. So we had to figure out a way to compute that sales gross profit on an ongoing basis. And so what we did was we used essentially a media attribution approach. And we did this on the site side data. So as people are coming through, we know if they did say A, B, C, and D, how many of those people bought a vehicle and how many didn't. We know if people did none of them because we have all of their transaction data. So if they never went to the website, we know how many of those existing customers bought data and didn't. And then if we know that someone did A, B, and D, so they skipped C, how many of those people bought? And by looking at all of those hundreds of thousands of combinations, we're able to understand what the value of each of those activities is. And the great thing about this is that the data that you need to do it is extremely simple. All we need to know is who the individual is, what the date and time that they had the activity is, and then what the category was. And then from that, we're able to use the um, attribution to then understand the value of how many sales were driven by inventory visits, how many were driven by looking at rebates and specials. Also knowing how many of those visits there are, we get a per value activity. So this takes this and makes this something that we can track on an ongoing basis. So every piece of media that flows through, we know the value that was driven. And so how this works in Domo, is going through the Domo R connector. So you can see there, so this is a view of R. And once again, you can go to rxa.io slash Domo and it will give you the um, link to everything and all the um, information and all the documentation around Domo R. But so you uh, install the library for Domo R and then within Domo you go to um, the advanced permissions and you get yourself an API key so that you can access your data in Domo. You use that, you put your instance name in. Obviously this is not a real instance here. But, um, so you put your instance name in, you put your API key, and then you can use, uh, there's basically four commands. So the first command is list. So you can just do list and it will list out every data set in your Domo instance. Or you can give it part of the name and it will list out anything that has that name. 
when it lists it out, it gives you a unique identifier for that data set. So then you can use a fetch command. And what that's going to do is through that Domo R connector, it will securely bring that data over to you. And so in this case, as I said, we had it set up on a cloud instance with a lot of horsepower. But if you're doing something small, you could run this off your desktop. It works the same exact way. And so then from there, you can manipulate all your data. You can use a create statement then to create a data set where you give it a name and you can give it a description. So then it takes that data that you have, and in this case it was looking at some um, validation curves. It's pushing those back over to Domo, creating a new data set for you. And then on an ongoing basis, if you want to update those, you can use that replace statement. But then, so this is how it works. Well, what it gives us then is something which once again takes those results and puts them in the hands of the individuals. So if we look on the far left on your screen, you can see by the different media types what the gross profit driven by those is. If we look in the middle, this is an example looking at retargeting of what the S curve is and what kind of that shape of diminishing returns is. And then probably the most important thing here is looking over on the right. This is giving us our attributed ROI and we can see it across our different channels. So we've kind of grouped them into awareness, consideration, and purchase. So on the awareness side, if you look in the middle there, we can see that's where SEM is. So that's where our search engine marketing is. And this is one thing that we find, it's below that dollar threshold, which means that for every dollar you spend, you're losing a bit of money. And so when we look at the curves for this and when we think back to that, you know, blue, green, and red, this is where most dealers are in red. Because dealers are afraid not to buy every term that they can because they think that someone else will. And that's where taking this and just going from that grand level of, okay, we're going to look at search and starting to group keywords into different things so they can see which ones have strong returns and which ones don't, that's where that real value is and they can start to optimize. And then if we look on kind of the purchase side, that's where we can see that, you know, what they're doing in social and pre-roll is actually kind of the one of the most valuable things. And so um, one of the um, marketing managers at the dealer group, you know, we did this analysis, we gave them back results, we gave them some recommendations, and they said, this is great. You know, we were able to take the data that we have, we were able to not spend more, but just tweak things, move things from one category to another, and that let us get a 17% increase in total gross profit. So um, as I wrap up here, I want to once again point out kind of these three takeaways after we've gone through this. So the first is that machine learning can help answer concrete business solutions. So these three things we talked about, once again, we're not trying to build Skynet here. It's not some grand system that's running your entire business in an automated fashion. We saw that we can use elasticities to understand the relationship between the um, applications that we receive and the interest rates that we have. We can use natural language processing to um, key in on some concerns that we can act upon. And then we can use um, an attribution approach to look and determine the value of media. Second thing is that Domo enables us to deploy these machine learning solutions in various ways. First way we looked at was SQL. You can do that in MySQL, you can do that in Redshift. It's something that's right there, it's available for everyone to do easily. Second one is using the scripting tiles through the magic ETL. So you can use that, you can drop your Python code in, and then you can get those answers back for you. Third way is using that Domo R connector to pull it off to access libraries that you might not be able to within Domo or to do some analyses that take more time that you want for scoring. And then the biggest thing of all though is that Domo takes those machine learning solutions out of the hands of the data scientists and puts them in those cards so that people can make decisions. So it really breaks down that walled garden that we've had and that I've just seen across organization and organization that I've worked with over the years. So it's no longer that you're doing this work and it's not being adopted because it's all in the same system, it's all run off the same data, so it really enables that value for people to have so they can make decisions and see how well machine learning can work for them. And with that, um, I will turn it over to any questions that anyone might have.
Hi, uh, my name is Jorge from GP Shopper. I've done some NLP before, but all our um, transcription was in-house, so it was easy to just go to the data. Mm -hmm. So for the um, AutoZone case, how did you pick the websites in which you wanted to scrape all the text? So um, what we do is we actually partner with um, some different places to get that data because what happens is you know, there's thousands and thousands, and so if we just focus on forums, there's thousands and thousands of forums, but they're all built off similar technologies, and in kind of those user agreements that no one reads, we're able to access that data by working through a handful of partners. So we can go um, across thousands of different sites, thousands of different things across a number of different countries pull that data in easily. So we've um, established those relationships for ourselves. So we don't pick the sites, we're able to see and then, you know, where they're discussing um, BMW car owners, you know, dot com, for instance, we're able to pull that data in without specifying that site. And we do all that through, um, we've created that connector in the app store. So we're able to do that just to essentially put the terms in that we want to use and then pull that data out and it comes back for us. Hi, Neil Banerjee from CoreLogic. Hi. Uh, I just had a question. When you were showing the code where you were importing the R libraries, were you, yes. were you doing that in, in the Domo R? Um, so, so that's um, using the Domo R library. So just to clarify, so Domo R is not something within Domo, it's something that Domo created to connect back and forth to R and to move that data back and forth. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, cool. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Blake Dive from Printer Logic. Question, so we saw where you imported the data into R and how you export it back into Domo. Yeah. What, what happens in R? You know, do you do the manipulation, the predictive an analytics in R before it's? Yeah, so in that case, we did a couple different things in R. One was we ran those Markov models, so we were able to use some Markov chain um, things that exist within R. The other things is so for the um, actual like S curves that we created, we used some deep learning models. So we used R to go out to H two O. And I've used R for years, so it's something that I tend to default to. But the nice thing is that within R, you can access everything from TensorFlow, Keras, H2O, and you can pull in all of those different things to run your models. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all very much for your time.